Yeah, so this is about uh, transistor load lines. I wasn't quite sure how to pitch this, because usually I talk at conferences where everyone knows everything about everything. So I basically went a few steps back and decided to talk about things I did not know when I started my master's. So I worked in industry for a few years, and I uh, came to Cardiff after that to um, continue studies. But when I, can you, does it do that? <laughs> Um, in the middle here. Okay. I can't see things. Um, <laughs> so when I came to Cardiff, there's a, I thought I knew everything about PAs because I've been working there for what, three years, four years. Uh, turns out I didn't. So I didn't know a lot of things that made understanding PAs really, really simple. And that might be because I I didn't do create an analog electronics. I think I failed the module twice. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you can still fail analog electronics and build PAs, so that works. But I, when I came to Cardiff, I had a couple of modules like that, and I, was like, I found a lot of ways that made me actually understand what's happening a lot easier. So I'm going to share a few of those with you, and I hope it kind of helps uh, some of you. And yeah, so these are the, um, the kind of PAs we designed where it worked. So it's like two and a half kilowatt, and they were designed to... Um, excite plasma, plasma chambers for uh, laser excitation. It's like really big things. Fairly low in, in frequency, fairly high in power. Like, um, And these are just a few examples where you need um, high power. So we need for like plasma excitation, property pings, and um, antenna. Like if you want to transmit over long ranges, you need a lot of power. And if you don't have the, what is it, 10 watt output power uh, directly out of your synthesizer, you need a PA. And uh, yeah, so PA is just there to amplify um, RF signals. As you probably all know, uh, you, you put input uh, RF input, you have a DC input, and you get um, uh, RF output, and you get heat. Well, a lot of heat sometimes. Now, this is, well, this is confusing. Was it that one? Yeah. Why does it do that? Um, so the important part of the PA is the, the matching networks because if you just put a PA, uh, take a transistor, connect it to your antenna, it's probably not going to work. Um, so the, this, these matching networks determine the gain, the output power, efficiency, linearity, all of that. So they're fairly important, one might say. But this is so fiddly. <laughs> but for them, you need... Uh, to, to design those matching networks, we need the impedances because you can't just take any impedance, connect it to transistor and antenna, it's going to work. So we might have the data sheet and they might give us the impedances if we're lucky. Or there might be an eval board available you could use or you could get the impedances off. You can model them if you, the, if you have the model and the software. You can uh, uh, do low pole measurements or ask someone else to do them if you don't have the equipment, which is fairly normal. Um, if you take a, back and look at a step back and look at transistors, you can see the, you probably have seen those IV curves in data sheets. And I mean, a lot of the time you just look at them and don't really, I, well, I didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, but so they consist of three, three distinct regions. So you have the, the, red, the, the dark red one, that's the, the linear region where the transistor behaves like a resistor. And it has, it's called linear region, but if you're there, you're not gonna have linear PA. You're going to have the linear PA in the saturation region, and that's where the, the current mostly depends on the gate voltage. And you have the breakdown region, and you don't want to be there. That's where the transistor just goes up in smoke or explodes quite violently, depending on the power levels you have. So, yeah. Um, these, these curves represent different, different gate voltages. So... so we know that by changing the gate voltage, we change the, the train current. And that you can model that as, um, as a voltage-controlled current source. And that's a surprisingly good model. Um, so in here, just it doesn't really matter what kind of source voltage train voltage you have. It's always the, the same current, more or less. And so the, the voltage that develops uh, as a result of this the, the excitation of the gate, that depends on the, the load impedance you put on there. 
Now the load line plots voltage versus current. So you know what's going to happen, you know what the voltage is when the current is something else. And um, what you often have the question point, that's the one in the middle. That's why your bias, your transistor, you can basically move that wherever you want. So this, this would be the supply voltage you use. And this is um, determined by the quiescent voltage, quiescent current in the case of a, of a bipolar. And if you have an, a short circuit, you get a lot of current, no voltage development. That's, that one's easy. You just see the, the volt, uh, current going up and down while the voltage does nothing. Now, this is what you have in your normal transistor. You have a load. So the, trans uh, the, the current goes up and down, uh, up and down, just like <laughs> up and down. And the voltage as a result of that, of, of the load if it's presented with, goes up and down as well. If you have a, an open circuit, if you forget to attach your load, your transistor produce, tries to produce current. There's no load really, so the voltage is going to be really high. So it banks into this end where nothing happens, banks into that end where the transistor blows up. So don't use it on open circuits. Um, boom. <laughs> yeah. So thing is, there's multiple PAs, PA classes, and the, the easiest one is a class A, where the load line I showed earlier, you get that. So basically, you start in the middle, just as you up the power, it goes up and down, up and down, further and further, till it reaches the... You don't want to go quite to the breakdown voltage, but you want to get in the area to get the most of the power out of this, and you want to get the, the highest current, because you don't want to use just like 5% of your transistor. That'd be stupid. Um, so the good thing about that one is it's super linear. It's perfect if you want a linear transmission and you get all of the gain. The downside is it's a bit inefficient because you can see what your P equals V over I. There's no point apart from this tiny bit down here where no current is consumed, well, no, no power is dissipated in the transistor. So it's amazing if you can get the heat away and if you don't have to put the energy bill. Uh, is it? Yeah. So that's why people were like, maybe, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should bias it differently. So if you set the Q point lower, down here, you don't consume any energy in, like if you're not sending any signals, and you don't send any energy for half of the half of the cycle, which is saving quite a lot of energy already. And as you can see, the 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 blue waveform up there. It's not a sinusoid waveform anymore. And that's quite nice because now we have a transistor. It's not linear. We don't have to have sinusoidal waveforms anymore. We don't, we can have different shit voltage and current waveforms. And to do that, we need to terminate the, the harmonics. So we need to make sure all the high frequencies are presented with a short circuit. And then we get that nice waveforms get up to about 80% efficiency. And yeah, it's still fairly linear. And uh, thing about it is because we, we are down here, it means the for the input signal we present to the transistor, half of it is just being cut off, which means we lose 6 dB of gain, which might be an issue if you work at high frequencies where you don't have a lot of gain. Mm. Now these measuring these IV curves is actually fairly simple. You might have, might have done it already. Um, so we just have two adjustable current voltage sources, one in the input, one in the output, and then one multimeter or two if you don't trust your, um, your voltage supply to, to get, tell you what voltage it, it outputs really. And then we just sweep um, the train voltage and the gate voltage. And one thing to make sure is that you stay clear from the maximum power because it, pre, it um, it produces heat during the, the whole sweep process. So imagine we are here. If you sweep here, you have what, 100 volts, two amps. It's probably not gonna like that. 200, 200 watt in this tiny transistor, that's not gonna last very long. So you have to stay clear of the maximum power and you have to stay clear of the break and voltage, obviously. Um, but I mean, this is not a big issue because 
the interesting thing is you want to know where that point is. This point, you kind of know it's in the data sheet, so you know where not to go. This one, you don't necessarily know if it's not on the data sheet. So measuring at, um, at those low supply voltages might be quite interesting. And yeah, so this is a measurement I did in the lab. It's a term uh, of, a, of a Cree 10 watt device, wolf speed 10 watt device. And we use it a lot because they send out free samples. And it's close to 50 ohms, which is nice. So you, don't, you can do a lot of things with it without breaking it. And it, it's, it's a very nice device. Um, so the, the maximum power depends on the mounting, according to the data sheet, which kind of makes sense, but also it's not very helpful. Um, so I try to limit it to 10 watt. And you can see that's the 10 watt um, curve here. And yeah, it works really well. You can easily see the, the different, different levels comparable to the, to the other measurement. And you can see this point is where you want to be. Breakdown voltage is like 100 volts or so. So it didn't measure all the way up there. And based on this, you can actually see where you want to have your load lines. Now, that's another one I measured. It's a bit of a lower power one. Um, this is milliamp. So yeah, um, but the, the nice thing about this is like, for this one, I, I measured it. That's the, the, the red curves. And I fitted a, a spice model, like the ones you can use in LT spice. And you can actually see they work fairly well-ish. And you can use these fairly simple, simple mod modeling approaches to give you a fairly good results. So this is the, the simulated output and the measured output. So they agree fairly well, and you can't even see the difference between some of the curves up here because they're so close together. So you can't, you can even with a, with a really, really simple model, so you can just pop into LT spikes, you can just simulate things. Now that might all sound really nice, but it's not always quite that easy. So um, physics get in the way. As, as they do. We have transistors, which are more than just a current source. We have, well, the transistors are tiny, which is an issue I'll tell you about in a bit. And we have a gun hands, which do weird shit. And so was it? Yeah. So not just a current source, because we have all kinds of things around it. And that's just like a, one transistor. Ideally, we work in a frequency where all of that is not relevant. We just here, all nice, all good. But if we're not quite as lucky, uh, we need to deal with all of those. And if we're lucky, someone else has dealt with them already, and they can show tell us what the big capacitances are. So for some of them, you can like for that ten watt device I mentioned, like all of the stuff over here that's well known. So you can look it up in a paper and it's like, it actually says you what you can put in there and that makes it fairly easy. Or you can make educated guesses based on the size of the device, or you can try manually optimizing it, which is a bit more tedious. <coughs> Another issue is that transistors are tiny. So the two, two kilowatt LDMOS device has about six by 25 millimeters um, silicon in, inside. It's not a lot. If you go like scale it down to 20 watt LDMOS, you have like 4.6 by 2.5 millimeters. It's quite tiny. And gun like gun devices are even smaller. So we need to pack them because I mean I don't know about you, but I don't have a wire bonder. And this is what a three watt device looks like, gun device. So 80 micrometers. I think that's about a width of a human hair. <coughs> so it's a bit hard to deal with. So we, we package them and the, de the, the package is a lot bigger than the device itself. You can see the device here, that's a six watt device. It's tiny. That's, the, the package is basically mostly empty and that's going to be the same for most packages you find with the transistor in because that packages are really cheap because everyone needs them and so you don't really make a special build package for your one device just to fit the size. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is like, well, I talked about class A and class B and how you get up to 80%, but that's not enough sometimes. Sometimes we need more power, well, more efficiency, sorry. And there's a few classes, but what all of them do is 
they reduce the, the voltage and current overlap. You can see here there's no voltage where there's current or uh, the other way around. So you can, if you look at that as a load line, it just goes up and, and along. So, I mean, they're the wrong way around, but it doesn't really matter because it's, it's the same thing. Um, so if you, if you manage to, to shape your, your waveform to not overlap, you get really high efficiencies. And realistically, you can get like 70 80 to 85%, depending on the frequency. And this is what a, measure one, a measurement looks like. So you can see it moves up here, then up. Not quite as perfect as it does in the, in the noise picture over there, where it looks like an L. But it is actually what happens. Um, now, sometimes we efficiency at, high, at, at maximum power is not all you need. Because if you um, have a, mod a modulation scheme where you operate the PN back off, like AM, you want efficiency not only where you have the most power, but also where you have less power. And that's not what most PAs do. So this is a, just an ideal PA, right? You're here. That's where you are most of the time. It's like 20% efficient. Even if you really re get like a really nice PA, measure it, works really well at full power, you back it off, it gets really, really hot. And that's not what you want typically. And there's two ways to deal with that. And one of them is you change the load impedance. So this is, this is your waveforms, the current and the voltage waveform. And you can see by just making that one, the, the current smaller, the voltage bigger, we can retrieve, we can get, basically get the same, same efficiency we used to get before. Another way is we move the green one just down. And yep, these are two methods that are actually done. And the one we're moving it down, that's, it's a really simple concept. And you can do that at, with any, any transistor. If it's, it's not really hard if you don't have high frequencies because you can just turn down the supply voltage and you get efficiency back. It's perfect. It's not quite as easy if you modulate it with a real signal because you can't turn the knob quickly enough. But you can have um, something do that for you, like a power supply with a, with a voltage control. Um, and that's, you can do that for slow signals. There's actually power supplies out there where you attach a control signal and it reduces the supply voltage for you. And that's fine until you want to communicate like at high, high data rates. And then it gets really, really hard because you have to change the supply voltage really quickly. And like suddenly all the people talk about um, what's a kilovolt per, per millisecond, uh, by, per microsecond of slew rates. And that's a bit. It's not quite trivial, so that's why that one's not, it's not an approach that works really well at high, high modulation rates just now. But I think if you have fairly low modulation rates, it might actually be really easy to implement, and it's really nice to not have a really hot PA. Another way to, to change the, the load was, like I mentioned, of it's that one, where you make the current waveform smaller, and the voltage waveform bigger. And you can achieve that by changing the load impedance. So as I mentioned earlier, it's like you get the same, the, the, the current, you, uh, the, the voltage is developed based on the load line and the current. So if you change the load line, you can change the output power and keep the, the efficiency high over a large power range. And there's multiple ways to do it. There's a Doherty, I think, did, did you talk about that last time? Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about Yeah, so Doherty does that. There's outfacing, there's load modulation, uh, balance amplifiers, that's what Dave's working on now. Um, you can use an adjusted matching network, for example, like a Varactor diode, and just if you adjust the voltage on that, you can use that to keep the, the PA efficient as well. Another topic that's quite interesting, well, I find quite interesting, are rectifiers. And they're typically not, they're not the typical RFPA topic, but they could be. So, um, why is it doing this? Yeah. 
because you can convert RF power to DC power, and because we have so much RF power around us, we can power things with it. Like, it doesn't have to be big things, but if you have sensors, you can put sensors anywhere and just have them report back to you without any connection. And that's brilliant. Thing is, for that, we need rectifiers that are able to take the small volt, like these small RF power levels we have all around us, and convert them to a DC signal. And yeah, now, yeah. And you can use diodes or transistors, but diodes have this pesky um, voltage. So, so they don't start rectifying from zero, which is really annoying if you have small signals. Well, transistors can do that, but you need to control the gate voltage. Otherwise, they're not going to do that. And now, if we... Transistors, it's something you really don't look at that often, but if a transistor um, is operated in negative uh, train voltages, it looks a bit different. So that's something you're never going to find in data sheets. And that's quite interesting. And you can measure that yourself as well. It, I, yeah, it's not really hard because you don't have a lot of power. Um, but the interesting thing is, see here, this is the diode, and over here, you have a lot less power consumption if you use the transistor to rectify the signal. And yeah, you can reach up to 90% with the transistor, 90% uh, RF to DC to conversion. So you can get a lot more um, DC power for the same RF power. And you just need to make sure you deal with your gate appropriately. And this is actual measurements on a, just a transistor with the, that I've, I've driven with the RF signal. And you can see here, this is what the load line looks like. It looks almost exactly like the class F waveform I looked before, only down this time, because it's the current's flowing the other way around. And this is what you actually, what the waveforms look like, the measured waveforms. So you see there's very little overlap, so you get a lot of efficiency. And, oh, why is it, yeah. Got around, finished, finally getting rid of that one. Um, so load, I sh hope I, it kind of made sense to all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was about how load lines work, what they are, and how we can use them to act, understand PAs without going into too much detail and going through all of the maths. Um, they, I kind of tried to show how you can use load lines in a, in a wide range of applications to see what's going on in a transistor and how you can use very simple measurements you can do at home to, to characterize certain systems, basically do first designs with them. And yeah, I think there's something missing, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. So there's any, why is it doing this? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you.